with support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association. Welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Kamers. Those are some sounds from Occupy Wall Street, the social movement that sprang to life in the fall of 2011 in New York City, and which in a few short weeks spread like wildfire to hundreds of cities around the world, from Santiago to Brussels. You know, Occupy was a big deal. It was a contagious idea that captured the feelings of the moment. And for most of us, the whole thing more or less emerged out of nowhere. It wasn't quite clear where Occupy came from. But in fact, the seed for the movement and the meme of occupying was the brainchild of two colleagues from Adbusters, an anti-corporate magazine based in Vancouver, Canada. It was in the summer of 2011 that my guest today, Michael White, along with the editor of the magazine, Callie Lassen, drafted out an email proposing the idea and sent it out to the magazine's network of followers and activists. In short, the message that they were sharing in the email was this. This September, let's occupy Wall Street. And as soon as they sent out the email, it was clear that their idea was hitting a chord. Within 24 hours, people started taking up the idea, making it their own, and just running with it. Occupy Wall Street was pretty revolutionary. It had been decades since we had seen a social movement, anything like it. And in many ways, it was a success. It changed the discourse, it opened up a nationwide, even worldwide, conversation about income inequality, and it galvanized a new generation of activists. But despite these wins, Occupy didn't actually achieve the change that its founders and its participants were hoping to create. The encampments were forcibly broken up by police later that fall, and attempts to revive the movement fizzled out. And in the end, the main issues that the movement was determined to solve, from money and politics to the control of the economy by the super-rich, remained firmly intact. Well, in his new book, The End of Protest, Michael White takes readers through a debriefing of sorts of Occupy Wall Street. He looks at what the movement achieved and what it didn't. And he comes away with the conclusion that the Occupy movement was a constructive failure. It was a failure, but one that we can learn from. Or, as Micah puts it, It taught us something. It taught us that the contemporary storyline that we have about activism and that we have about what creates social change isn't true. Micah argues that what Occupy showed us, in other words, is that the traditional forms of protest that activists have been relying on, from marches to sit-ins, are no longer effective at achieving real social change. And if we want to bring about the critical changes in our society that we need, then we need to fundamentally rethink the nature of protest and activism. And while it's not directly about reducing emissions, figuring out how to bring about social change is maybe one of the most crucial elements of overcoming the climate crisis. Because unless we achieve a huge transformation in how our societies and economies operate, everything about life on our planet and the environments we depend on could be forever changed. And after 30 years of waiting, it seems clear that scientists warning us of the dangers and our politicians making pronouncements about it won't by themselves get us anywhere close to where we need to go. So for his thoughts on activism, the future of protest, and how social change occurs, here's my conversation with Micah White. Well, Micah White, welcome to The Elephant. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. You know, if if there's one thing that I took away from reading your book, uh, something sort of tangential, it's that your interest in activism started rather early on. Um, you have a few examples from, from high school where you were already fighting the, the powers that be, in a sense. I wondered if you could just first tell me about the, the story where you established an atheist club at your school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I've been an activist my entire life. I started in activism, started doing activism like when I was basically 13. And then every year I would kind of like do a new, another camp, a new campaign, you know, on a, on a new issue. Um, so when I was 17, one probably the first, you know, really successful campaign that I did was I, my family moved to Michigan to this kind of conservative town. I went to a public school that was pretty religious, even though it was supposed to be a public school. And I was doing some research about the law and I found out that there's this, there's this thing in America called the Equal Access Act, which says that basically if a school allows a, you know, religious club, like a Christian club, then they have to allow clubs of all different kinds of religions and belief systems. And so I kind of like immediately saw the campaign potential here because, you know, if they have a Christian club, which they did, then I could start a different kind of club. So I decided to start an atheist club, which which was you know, obviously extremely controversial and they and they tried to block it. They, you know, the the principal basically, you know, the vice principal ran from me in the hall once and all this kind of stuff. 
but I but because I was an activist, I um, kind of recorded what was going on, and then I sent a letter to to the nonprofit in Washington D.C., the legal nonprofit that had been instrumental in drafting the law, and they they took on the case pro bono. They sent a threatening legal letter to my school saying, you know, if you don't allow this atheist club, then we're going to um, sue you. And the school completely capitulated. And it was like a really early victory for me to see that, you know, here I am, a 17-year-old in a new school, and I'm overcoming the resistance of the of the administration. And, you know, it kind of spiraled, and I got onto, like, national television and all this kind of crazy stuff. So that was like an early, an early activism that kind of – it showed me that campaigns can really, you know, go in surprising directions. Well, you said you started when you were 13. What was your, what was your first sort of active activism? I think my very first active activism um, was in America. There's this, you know, daily pledge of allegiance where you kind of um, stand up and pledge your allegiance to the U.S. government. And uh, so my first act of resistance was a kind of just not standing and not saying this pledge. And it was it was pretty interesting because basically what happened is that um, you know other people in the class started to like see that I wasn't standing, and then they well maybe I shouldn't stand and. It, it kind of became this, like, you know, like, activism has this potential to kind of inspire other people to mimic your disobedience, and that's what I, what kind of happened, and the, and the school was very upset, and they ended up kicking me off my, you know, final, uh, whatever, middle school graduation <laughs> field trip. Um, yeah. I, I guess, yeah, it's like uh, with the substitute teacher, once, uh, once they lose a bit of control, then things can quickly get out of hand for them. Exactly. Exactly. And that I think and that principle extends all the way to like society at large. You know, there's once once the people start to rise up and, and things kind of spiral in interesting direction, like we're seeing in Brazil right now, um, no one really knows what what's going to happen. So do you have a sense of where this came from, though, like uh, being that involved and, and willing to be somewhat of a, of a rebel early on is, is rather rare, I would say. Do you have a sense of where that came from? Um, you know, that's just that's one of those things I think about a lot because um, it's kind of like you know why am I why am I this way? Um, but so on the one hand, you know, maybe there's a biographical reason, which is that my my dad is African American and my uh, mom is white, and so when they got married, it was still illegal in many states within America to be in an interracial marriage. There was anti. Uh, you know, they call it miscegenation and all this kind of stuff. But there was anti-interracial marriage laws. So they, so their very active marriage was a kind of activism. And in that sense, like, you know, I'm like the, the child of an activist love. And so, but I think also, I just think that it's something, it's a little bit more, it's like more intuitive. It's like, why do some people want to be painters? You know, why do some people want to be artists? Or, or you know, what is it that gives people that internal passion to follow something? I just feel like it just always fascinated me. And I always thought that, like, I just always, I was fascinated and I always studied it and read about it and practiced it. And then once, you know, people used to tell me, oh, you shouldn't do activism because it's going to ruin your life. (laughs) You're not going to get into college. They would tell me that in high school. Um, But instead, on the contrary, once I started to see, wow, I'm like, I'm really good at this thing. And if I stick at it, you know, who knows? And I always had a face that I would create something like Occupy Wall Street, just like I have faith that I'm going to be able to create something even bigger than Occupy Wall Street. So I don't know. It's just something, it's just something in me. And I guess with the, the example of your parents, like it being illegal in some places for them to even be married, I mean, that would be a pretty clear indication to you at a young age that not all laws, not all rules are, are right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, now interracial marriage, especially in America, is like so common. It's almost like, you know, the new cool thing. But but when I was a kid, it was it was rare. It was rare. You know, I feel like I'm like one of the first, maybe second generation of like interracial kids and so even as I was growing up I always had this experience of being neither white nor black and never really feeling like I couldn't just I think unlike other people I couldn't just like fall into the collective and be like everyone else because you know if I hung out with my white friends I was always the only black kid but if I hang out with my black kids then I was always like this person who's actually kind of white because he has a white mother and you know half of his relatives are white and so it's always put me a kind of um it gave me a different perspective so I want to fast forward to to Occupy. You were a co-creator of Occupy and Occupy Wall Street. What did the seed for this this come from? Well, the, you know, the, so basically what happened is that at that time, you know, back in 2011, I was an editor at Adbusters Magazine, which is based in Vancouver, Canada.
Canada. And that was like my dream job. I had worked my way in there, and I was in this very positive and um, magical collaboration with the founder. And we basically, you know, we were in 2011, early 2011. I'm sure people remember there was this, this basically this Arab Spring, this uprising that happened across the Arab world, that spread to Cairo, Egypt, with the Tahrir uprising. And people started to kind of they they stayed in the Tahrir Square and demanded Mubarak step down. And then he did. And then it, it inspired another wave, and it spread to Spain. And then the people of Spain started like going into the squares and holding these general assemblies. So at Adbusters, Cullen and I would talk on the phone every day for a few hours, you know, and we were just brainstorming. And, and, and like a lot of people, we started, you know, we were just wondering, like, how can we bring this to America? How can we, how can we bring this to America? Because we realized it was such a revolutionary moment. I had lived in Egypt for, for like nine months before the revolution, so I understood the severity of these protests. I understood that protest in Egypt is not something that just, it just happens, you know. And so... We basically, what we did is we, we wrote a tactical briefing, that's what we called it and, it, and we said basically that, hey guys, hey Americans, hey world, what we need to do is combine the tactic of the Tahrir uprising with what's going on in Spain, the General Assemblies in Spain, and occupy Wall Street. <laughs> and, and we sent that out, we made this like surrealist ballerina and bold poster, you know, and it just took off because the time was ripe. And so as soon as we put out that tactical briefing, within 24 hours, people started taking up the idea, making it their own, and just running with it. So, And this was sent out through the, the Adbusters email list? Exactly. We sent it out on the Adbusters email list, and then I, like, went out, run around and, like, posted it on Reddit. And, you know, I was the first person ever to, to send a hashtag Occupy Wall Street tweet and all this kind of stuff. You know, I emailed everyone, I, all the activists I knew. And it's really important, though, to realize that it's not, even though some people took it up immediately and saw the potential, the vast, vast majority did not. And they told us it's not a good idea. <laughs> you know, we're not interested. And that's kind of why Occupy was a success, really, is because it, it attracted a different, it, it didn't attract the usual protest activist crowd. Instead, it attracted people who had a kind of revolutionary intuition about this event, and they and they made it work. They made it happen. So you sent out the email in, in what, like June, right? Yeah, we sent out um, June, July, basically, yeah. And it was, it was calling to go to Wall Street on September 17th. Right. So and I, what I find kind of remarkable is, you know, I think you were in Berkeley, right, at the time? Right, I was living in Berkeley and Ephesus is in Vancouver. Right, and so you're calling for this like event on the other side of the country. Um, right. It seems kind of amazing that, well, you need to have a certain confidence to kind of call for something like that, especially being so far away. And then, then the fact that it actually somehow somehow resonated, it somehow worked. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's magic, you know. <laughs> in some sense, it's magical. It's magical. Um, it's just, you know, we had tried at Adbusters, we had... Adbusters had, first of all, I mean, you have to take into consideration that Adbusters had for 20 years been kind of developing a, a following among activists. Um, and we had also, the year before, we had tried to call for some protests around the country that, that didn't really happen. But I think that the true essence of what it is is that basically, you know, social movements are created by combining a, con a contagious mood with a new tactic. And so the whole world at that time was permeated with a contagious mood that was coming from the Arab world. Everyone was watching, I mean, activists were watching what was going on in the Arab world and Spain and stuff. And so we gave the people a new tactic. We said, you know, we, with that tactical briefing, we basically showed people like, we, you know, we imagined for people like, wow, this could actually be revolutionary. So I think it, it just kind of captured people's imaginations. And, 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 all you, and basically 200 people in New York started organizing for it, and that's all we really needed in order to make it um, into a global sensation. And so were you caught off guard uh, at first that it, that it did work so well? I mean, I guess when was the moment where you stepped back and said, wow, this is, this is something that we've really unleashed here? Mm. Well, I think we definitely had a sense. I had a sense, you know, very early on that this was going to be something that was big because, and I remember even some journalists asked me, you know, like, oh, you know, what's going to happen? Is this even going to be 
big are people going to stay? And I just knew that it was going to be big, mainly because because of the way that other activists took the idea as their own. I think that the most most campaigns that activists try to do, it's like it's like drudgery. You're like pushing it out there. You're like convincing people. But this one, it wasn't like that. It was like it was like rolling a ball downhill. You just kind of like we dropped the idea, and there was just so much momentum behind it that you know people were taking it up. But I think the defining moment of Occupy that kind of like did start to surprise everyone is, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge arrest where they arrested 700 occupiers in a couple weeks after the movement started. And that's that's really the time in which that's when it finally spread globally because all of a sudden people all over, all over the world started to tune into Occupy and started to mimic our behaviors. And that's when I think within 24 hours, you know, we spread to like, you know, 82 countries or something crazy. So, um, that I think was the defining moment when I realized like I can't even comprehend what's going to happen next. Yeah, so it's a good good sign that you had lost control of it. Or I guess you never tried to control it either. Yeah, but we definitely, you know, I mean, all we could do is try to influence it, and we wrote we ended up writing like twenty or thirty more tactical briefings. Um, but yeah, we never were able to control it. We didn't really try to control it. The ethos at that time was this idea that, you know. It, it should be controlled by the participants themselves. I mean, one of the central criticisms of Occupy was that there wasn't a, a central demand, uh, which is interesting because in your early tactical briefings, it, it kind of was a, a, a central demand of trying to get the influence of money out of out of politics. Do you, do you think that was uh, a mistake? Well, you know, it's you know, if you so yeah, I mean, if you go back to the the original tactical briefing. You know, it's very clear. Like what we said basically is let's combine Tahrir with Spain. Let's go down to the Wall Street and let's hold a General Assembly to decide on our one demand. And what we think that one demand should be is to get money out of politics, you know, to, to stop the, the power that money has over our democracies. And But the thing is, is when you create an event that relies on the participants themselves rather than the creators, then you're beholden to the culture that takes it up. And the culture that took up the idea for Occupy Wall Street in New York City, they believed in something called prefigurative anarchism, which isn't something I had even heard of before. <laughs> and, and their idea, their, their philosophy was, um, let's not make any demands. Instead, we need to like build the ideal society in this microcosm of, uh, you know, a Zuccotti Park, and and that's why they, it was all about free food and like consensus-based decision making, all this kind of stuff. But it wasn't very, you know, it wasn't strategic. It wasn't a strategic way of going about it. And so, I think you know, it's it's what it is is it's basically like social movements and protests are like experiments, and we were testing a hypothesis. And the hypothesis we were testing was prefigurative anarchism, this idea that we can just kind of, oh, we don't need to have a demand. Well, we found out that that's not true, and I don't think that we're going to see that happen again. I think that people understand now that we do need to have, if not a demand, at least a, an eye on trying to actually gain political sovereignty. You know, I, th- I think I remember for myself watching Occupy. Uh, I wasn't, you know, an active participant or anything, but just observing it. For a moment, it did seem like, wow, this is this is something special. It seemed like we're in this moment where where anything could happen. It changed the dialogue. It changed, uh, I think, the sense of society. Finally, like we were actually talking about inequality, and there was the we are the ninety nine percent. I think it really changed the discourse, and I think it's also surprised a lot of people by sort of fizzling out. First, could you just like recap, like uh, how how did it come to an end in America? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so what happened basically is that the movement gets got started on September 17th, and then it was basically ignored for the first week. And then around the second week, there was a kind of, first the police pepper sprayed some women, and that got onto, like, national television. And then the Brooklyn Bridge arrest happened in, like, early October, or something like that. And then, so then the movement exploded. And it exploded everywhere. It was just everywhere. And what happened basically is that it attracted the, you know, overwhelming police state response. And so they started to send in infiltrators. They started to, in New York City, they started to exploit the open nature of the movement by um, sending people into the assemblies to disrupt the assemblies. And then they started sending, um, they would, the police officers would like, and this is like documented, the police officers would like find drunk people from other parks in the city and tell them to go down to Zuccotti, otherwise they're going to get arrested and, and so basically, they started to flood 
our encampments with homeless people and drunk people and people on drugs and people who are disruptive and some of them police officers and and so by you know by early November and going into mid November it started to get colder and the mood within the um, encampments really started to shift and at Adbusters actually we said on November 14th basic we said hey guys like you know mood is the mood's really shifting I think it's we think it's best to like declare victory and um, you know go home and then come back in the spring. And the very next day after we sent out that tactical briefing is when Bloomberg carried out a paramilitary eviction of Zuccotti. He you know closed the airspace. He sent in the you know armored police and all this kind of stuff with bulldozers and and they basically just destroyed the entire encampment um, you know at like three in the morning. And once that happened, that's really the moment in which the movement basically lost because it lost its spiritual home. And moreover, it gave the police a practical playbook for dismantling the encampments. And I think before that moment, no one really knew how, knew how to get rid of the encampments, but then Bloomberg figured it out with his kind of like paramilitary approach. And then within a week, all of the encampments or most of the encampments around the world were kind of evicted. And the ones that remained basically became, you know, homeless encampments, not kind of like revolutionary political encampments. And then ultimately the death of the movement happened on the May 1st with the general strike that just completely fizzled and was based on a bad idea. So you call in the book Occupy a constructive failure. So so what do you mean by that? Constructive failure means that the movement um, failed. It didn't it, it didn't totally fail. It had some positive benefits like for example, you know, it, like you're saying, it changed the discourse. It, it trained a whole new generation of activists um, who now are part of Black Lives Matter and other stuff like that. It made activism and protesting cool again. I think even you know, in the years prior to Occupy Wall Street, it wasn't cool to be an activist. Whereas, it, it definitely around the time of Occupy, but even up until now, I think activism is now a cool thing to do. Um, so it wasn't a total failure. But it was a constructive failure because it failed to achieve the objective that we set out, which was to get money out of politics. And in failing to do that, it taught us something. That's why it's constructive. It taught us that the contemporary storyline that we have about activism and, and that we have about what creates social change isn't true. And even when you achieve, I mean, it's extremely difficult to achieve what we did with Occupy Wall Street, which is to create something that spreads to 82 countries. And when you achieve that, and it doesn't change doesn't create the social change you want, then you have to start to realize like, oh, maybe this story we've been telling ourselves isn't true. And so that's kind of what the main, main idea here is. It's a constructive failure that you know, helps us understand that we've, as activists, have been chasing um, an illusion. You know, I have to say when I, when I read that argument in the book that, you know, your takeaway was that the protest was ineffective, that, you know, the old modes of protest were ineffective, it kind of caught me off guard because because when you think about it, even something that is as successful as Occupy was with changing the discourse, I mean, that is rare, you know, and to me, you could have taken the opposite conclusion to say this, this method is, is working, we just need to, to do it. And, and maybe next time we'll, we'll have a different outcome. Mm. Why were you so sure that that it wasn't just, you know, luck of the draw that it didn't work this one particular time? Mm, yeah, yeah, I think it's because, you know, the, the thing about contemporary activism is that we're so rarely willing to admit that, that defeat, and we're so rarely willing to admit that things aren't working. And so I think that part of the way that we deceive ourselves is by lowering the horizon of possibility. And so instead of thinking, oh, like we can, we can have an actual revolution, we can create um, you know, dramatic social transformation or social change, we instead kind of lower our expectations and we start to celebrate things like, well, we changed the discourse. And, you know, but, you know, changing the discourse and, and bringing up the argument about income inequality were not the primary goal of Occupy Wall Street. They were just symptoms of the fact that we spread to 82 countries. And, and you will always be able to achieve that goal if you, if you create a global social movement. Like, there's no way that you can create a movement that spreads to 82 countries without also changing the discourse around whatever thing you're talking about. I mean, it was a cultural phenomenon. And so the, I think the, the, what I'm trying to get across to activists is that we need to basically reorient and keep our eyes on the real prize. Um, instead of celebrating Occupy as success, which I think doesn't allow us to learn from why it didn't succeed, and I think you can see that with most activism that continues today, is that I don't think people learned from why 
Occupy didn't work, you know? And if we just keep repeating the same, if we keep chasing the same storyline, then we're just wasting our energy, you know? So I think that's just, I think it's just the, kind of the core idea is that, you know, we're deceiving ourselves. And it's kind of hard for people to, to like, accept, but man, that's kind of what's going on. And so when you say protest is dead, like what specific things are you saying don't work anymore or we shouldn't expect to work? Yeah. So specifically, I think what what doesn't work is this idea that to create social change, you need to get the largest number of people in the streets as possible doing largely nonviolent behaviors, largely unified around a single demand. I think that that is not necessarily effective, um, particularly in like democratic countries in the West that have now started to see mass protests as just part of the, um, you know, part of the political game, part of what you're supposed to expect as a politician. And, you know, I think like you can go back historically, can figure out when did that moment happen? I think it really happened in 2003 when we had a global anti-war march where every, you know, every country had so many people in the streets and they all said no to the war. And George Bush, after the after everyone you know protested and went home, he got on live television, and I will never forget. He said basically, "I don't listen to focus groups. Listening to these protests would be like listening to focus groups. I don't decide my policy based on focus groups. I do what I think is right." Democracy is a beautiful thing, and that people are allowed to express their opinion. And I welcome people's uh, right to say what they believe. Secondly, you know, size of protest is like deciding. Well, I'm going to decide policy based upon a focus group. When he said that, I think it, it, it fundamentally shattered one of the core assumptions of activism, but it's still taking us 10 years to learn and understand what he's saying, which is that it doesn't matter if you protest, if you get millions of people in the world to say no to the war, it does not matter because I'm still president and there's nothing that forces me from listening to you. Therefore, you know, it doesn't matter. And so I think that, the, the, I think that we have to understand that it gets a lot of publicity, it raises awareness around an issue, but it doesn't achieve the social change that we want. And, and you say it's the same for the, the People's Climate March in New York in 2014 right. that attracted 400,000 right. people? Right, right. And I think that we can really see it with, I mean, the People's Climate March, they should have known better. Um, instead, it's being co- like basically taken over by these kind of, you know, like these Avaz types who have no revolutionary intuition. Instead, they just kind of base their decisions on metrics and analytics. And what they're, what they're interested in doing is social marketing, not social activism. And, and that's why they're so fixated on like, well, we, you know, we got the people to like hear about this new idea or whatever, because what they're trying to do is market in ideas. And what activists are trying to do is achieve political power and social transformation. And that's a completely different game. I just want to point out one one exception that I, I kept thinking about when I was reading your argument, which is the fight of the Keystone Pipeline, which started in 2010 or so. And it really did kind of use old school activism. You know, people got arrested in front of the White House. There was various actions like uh, civil disobedience and acts like that. And in the end, it, it was successful. Something that seemed inevitable that it would go ahead a few years later was struck dead. Yeah, I mean, but it's still, I'm just, I don't find it very compelling because I think that fundamentally what, what you're saying is like, is that basically, you know, the best that activists can hope for is to, is to do protests that somehow at the very best convince the person in power to change their position on something rather than, which I think is, that's, that's a fine that if that's your goal, but I think that's different than the other goal, which is we are trying to change, you know, either change who's in power or even better, become the people in power. I think that what I'm saying is that activists have kind of given up on this, on, on revolution, and now they start, to, they start to celebrate something different, which is, you know, oh, we're really good at lobbying or at our politicians or convincing them to change. And, like, this is, it's, just, it's something different. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, that protest doesn't ever like achieve anything positive or anything like that. But what I'm saying is it's not achieving the, it's not achieving the the really, the the ultimate goals. You know, I think ultimately if you want to solve climate change, you have to, we have to fundamentally change like, you know, who runs this world and how this world is organized and these kind of deeper questions. Right. Which makes it pretty, pretty daunting to try to confront. 
Yeah, but daunting, but not, but not completely unrealistic. I mean, during the Arab Spring, they did topple governments, and so they did topple Mubarak. And then, I mean, of course, it didn't turn out that well. But still, like you can, it is possible to imagine. I think during Occupy, we could imagine, um, you know, toppling Obama, you know, briefly. But, but, and so that's the challenge: is to imagine how is it that, like, instead of instead of demanding of the people in power, how do we become the people in power? How do we, how do we get back to that old you know, what revolution used to mean, the Russian revolution was a, was the people, the workers and the peasants actually like overthrowing the czar. And like, so it's like, how do we actually get to that position where the, where the 99% is overthrowing the 1%, not just cajoling the 1% into like begrudgingly accepting certain things, and all that kind of stuff. And so back to a point you made a couple of minutes ago. So you, so you don't think we can solve the, the climate crisis by kind of incremental wins? No, no, absolutely not. No, I think, no. <laughs> I think what we need is some sort of, um, I mean, the climate crisis is a, global, is a global challenge that can only be solved by a global social movement. Um, but but why, why specifically do, do you think that we can't win this fight through, through incremental reform? Why, why does it need sort of a whole new, new system or, or idea of, of society? Well, I think it's, you know, I think that we are at an impasse and it just doesn't, to me, seem feasible to imagine that the very system that got us into the problem would also just be able to, like, slowly change itself out of the the problem. I think it's kind of like wishful thinking and I think it's a nice thing to imagine because it sounds so much more pleasant than, than talking about revolution, but to me it seems much more likely that that only a, you know, only a global people's government, this is what I think, only a global people gov- people's government can solve the global challenges that face us. Otherwise, we're still stuck with these these borders that are going to block climate refugees with these, you know, these nation states. Like, for example, with, you know, it's interesting that example of the, um, like the Paris climate talks where and then Obama gets back and then the Supreme Court all of a sudden like decides, well, we're going to put your, your, you know, your clean air energy thing on hold or whatever. So, so it's like, we need to develop a a kind of global governance of the people that can kind of supersede these forces. Otherwise, we're going to be constantly, I think, dragged back down. You know, when, when you say, like, we need revolution, I think a, a reaction for a lot of people will be like, well, you know, how often do revolutions actually actually work? And how often do they actually become something that is better than the what the old system was? So often, like, look at Egypt right now, where... There was a revolution, there was uh, some brief change, and now it's back to worse than it was before, arguably. And, uh, you know, with the Russian revolution, one system just replaced another system of, of oppression. So, so what, what is your response to, to that, that, you know, we don't know what would, will happen if there is a, a new order that comes into to place? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. We also don't know, like, what will happen if we don't do anything. I mean... I think that the the thing to realize though is that like revolution is an integral part of human civilization. We've been having revolutions since like ancient Egypt. Like we have a papyrus that that you know talks about a revolution happening against the king in ancient Egypt and all this kind of stuff. So we we know that revolutions are re, are a recurring phenomenon in human history and that they'll always happen at some point again in the future and that they serve a kind of useful purpose within society. They serve the purpose that they serve is that they allow humans to break out of their old patterns to suddenly um, change the change the nature of, of civilization, evolve to higher levels. I think what motivates your question is, is that, you know, a lot of people are, are like afraid of revolution because actually in our hearts, we, we fear change. Um, but, but I think that what, what we have to remember though, is that, is that revolution is integral, and everything that we have today is the result of revolution. I mean, the American Revolution, you know, like, democracy itself is a product of revolution. And so, you know, it's true that, that the idea that we're going to somehow have, like, some glorious revolution that results in a permanent utopia is, is probably not true. But the idea instead that we're going to have, that, we might, that it might be a little bit messy, but that in some ways it'll fundamentally, like, improve the lives of large numbers of people around the world and... I think it's true, you know, it's something that we have to strive over, strive after, while at the same time, I think you're right, to be, to not be, you know, so naive, (laughs) you know, about it. It's not, 
I agree with you. It's a messy, it's an intense thing. It's kind of, it's, you know, protest, I think, is really like a form of war. And it's, it's, it's like war in that, in that sense, too, that, that it's messy and that it's, it's chaotic and dangerous, but sometimes it's necessary, you know. And I think we're in one of those moments now where it's, it's necessary. And so it'll happen whether or not we really want it to or not. Well, as you say in the book, uh, freedom isn't free. Yeah, yeah. And everything that all the rights that we have today, we had to fight for are in the past. So, and that's really hard for people because we, 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 you know, no one alive today has, you know, lived through the Russian revolution, you know, so all of these things are kind of, for most people in the world, they're kind of distant memories and we don't quite even know what it is or what it felt like or, or anything. So it's clear, I mean, regardless of whether we call it revolution or not, or, or consider it revolution, it's clear that the system needs to change. It's, uh, the inertia of the system right now is is leading us to to disaster, unless unless we re, you know drastically reduce our our emissions and and move towards sustainability. So so coming away with uh, this idea then that you know we need societal change and we need maybe new ways of doing it if the old ways have have stopped working. What what is your thought then? Like what so what is your advice to to activists? Mm. Well, I think, you know, if we go back to basically what happened with Occupy and especially like in Spain, is what we see is that, you know, the Spanish movement in particular, they, they erupted really near to one of their, their elections. And, and at that time, you know, we didn't want leaders, we didn't want elected representatives, we didn't want to get voting and stuff. So the Spanish people were like, you don't represent us, we're not going to vote and all that kind of stuff. And so what happened is that a right-wing government immediately got into power because no one on the left voted. And I think that the activists there, they, they've really learned their lesson. And so now, years later, they've launched something like, called Podemos, which is a, uh, a social movement that also is a political party. And, they, and within you know, like two years, they've become a major political force within Spain. And so I think that that right there holds the kernel of what North American activists need to learn, which is that just like Occupy, its inspiration came from, came from Spain partly, we need to learn this lesson, which is that it's time for North American activists to build social movements that can win elections in multiple countries in order to carry out a unified geopolitical agenda. And I think specifically, if you think about climate change, you know, imagine, imagine the scenario where, where instead of having like the U.S. versus you know, negotiating against China, against you know, these different governments, you actually had a, had a people's party that had won elections in America and Canada and you know, other states and maybe pulled off a revolution in some undemocratic states. And then they negotiated with themselves <laughs> about climate change. You know, that's, that's the ultimate vision. That's the ultimate goal. Of course, that's, you know, that's also it's difficult to achieve. And that's like, you know, basically what the, what the Russian revolution failed to do. They also tried to start uh, and, and export revolutions to other countries. So so it's not like an easy task, but, but, you know, I think it says something that they kind of saw the strategic necessity of it. And then now again, we're seeing the strategic necessity of it. So I think it's time to kind of raise our, raise the bar a little bit. I mean, that sort of, you know, international coordinated effort to, you know, have domestic political power in, in various countries. That also seems like something that's hard to imagine. Um, and mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, how much is that a, an obstacle here that it's really hard to break out of our thinking of what is politically possible right at this moment. And I think that's true throughout history. It's really hard to, to see something happening before it happens, and then it kind of becomes inevitable. So how much of a role do you think uh, breaking out of our habituated patterns of thinking and our understanding of what is possible, how much does that play a role in, in making this possible? Yeah. The thing is, that, you know, this is this, it's hard to to understand but you know if you go back to the you know the weeks or whatever before occupy you have to remember that no one thought it was a good idea so even though it reached mass appeal and 82 countries and all this kind of stuff within i think within 28 days more than half of americans had heard about occupy wall street and so it reached this mass awareness but when it's but when we originally pitched the idea the vast 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 majority even of people who later you know tried to basically um, co-opt the movement they they, it, they it was rejected and so this is the this has to do with the nature of how new ideas enter society and it has to do with basically that new ideas make us uncomfortable but that doesn't mean that the new ideas are wrong <laughs> it in fact sometimes can mean that that they are primed to kind of take off 
So I think as activists, it's important to realize that if we want to create a mass movement, we don't actually pitch mass ideas. Instead, what we do is we pitch ideas from the edges of politics, and we transpose them into new, new territories. And that seems to kind of capture people's imaginations, because all of a sudden, they, it's almost like when they see an idea that they, that they didn't think worked, but they see it starting to work, it's almost like they're twice as engaged by the idea. You know, it's, there's something kind of like, it's like they, they get surprised and then all of a sudden they get excited by this fact that this, this, thing that this thing that shouldn't be working is suddenly working. Like, this is amazing. Like, I'm going to join this thing. So, so, that's, so that's, you know, that's why it's, it's, for me it's endlessly interesting to hear people kind of say the same things about the social movement winning elections in multiple countries as they said about Occupy. You know, like if we had told people like, oh, yeah, we're going to Occupy Wall Street, then somehow it's going to spread to 82 countries and all this kind of stuff, they'd be like, no, it's not going to happen. So it's just really important, I think, to kind of raise our horizon of possibility and kind of dream big because it, it can happen. It will happen. You, you forward an idea in the book called mental environmentalism. And, and one quote you have is um, saying that there's probably a relation between the pollution in our minds and the, the pollution in the world. So, so can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, sure, yeah. So, this, so the, you know, the subtitle of Adbusters, where I used to work, is the Journals of Mental Environment. This is where I was really um, first kind of uh, introduced this idea, but then later kind of developed more of it. And I think one example that, that's good, I don't necessarily get into it in the book, but I think one way of thinking about it is to kind of think about the passenger pigeon. <laughs> you know, the passenger pigeon, it was this species of bird in, in, in North America. And it's got, people got to go back and read about this. It was so crazy. They had, there were so many. When the Americans first started kind of like, even up until the um, 1800s, there were so many passenger pigeons that they would basically, you know, they would like black out the sky. They would have flocks that were like, you know, half a mile long, all just insane, insane. And then in like the, you know, 1800s at some point, the last passenger pigeon died, you know, and I think that it's kind of like, so you ask yourself, well, why did the passenger pigeons go extinct? How could it possibly happen that this, that this bird that was so plentiful went ex- extinct? And I think that traditional environmentalism would basically say, well, we're going to create some, like, we're going to give some materialist reasons. It was because it was overhunted. It was because of, you know, maybe their habitat was destroyed and all this kind of stuff. But I think there's like another option, which is basically that, that we didn't, People didn't see the passenger pigeon. They didn't like. It didn't really. It's almost like they didn't. They didn't notice that it was there until it was gone. And so, it, there's a kind of interaction. What I'm trying to get at is there's a kind of interaction between how we perceive the world, and how the world manifests. And I think so. On the one hand, when we don't when we don't know the names of trees and notice the notice like the variation of species and all the different kind of animals around us. It's almost like when they disappear, we don't notice. But I think on the other hand, you know, we have this, there's this, this, there's a physical environment that surrounds us, but there's also an environment within us. And when that environment within us, the mental environment is polluted, it changes our behavior. And, and, and that's really, I think, what motivates how we, how we, uh, you know, poison the external reality. Like you just said, you argue that there's a big sort of cultural and even spiritual component to to bringing about change. So, so what role do you see spirituality or our internal mind playing? Yeah, there's you know the the dominant theory of activism is that social change and revolution is the product of human action in the material environment. This is like very, this is very common. So like this is why we celebrate direct action. We say like you know if we want to solve climate change or if we want to solve uh, income inequality, then we got to do something with our bodies. Like we got to go into the streets. We got to do direct action. We got to identify, you know, who's the, the the culprit and like go out there and protest in front of them. So that's one that's one option, and and that's called then you know I call that like volunteerism. But there's another option, and that's that you know that the that that external reality is kind of a product of our minds, and that if we were to change our how we see the world, we might actually be changing the world, and that's kind of called subjectivism. And those and I think those, you know, they, it presents an interesting kind of thing to think about, especially when it comes to climate change, which, is, which has been dominated by a narrative, of, like an apocalyptic and dark narrative about, about the future. And you sometimes, sometimes I wonder, like, you know, how much of this dark world is just the product of our apocalyptic narratives about what's happening and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Can you talk about the role of memes? 
Yeah, memes. You know, I think the, the, the so the core the core thing about you know, like I said, is how to create a social movement is you basically combine a contagious mood with a with you know a new tactic, and so memes are, allow us to do both of those things. They 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 spread very quickly, you know, throughout society, and they teach people new behaviors. And I think that you know, meme is basically a contagious idea. And I think previously those have been very simple. And I think with Occupy Wall Street, they started to get a little bit more complex. You know, the meme Occupy Wall Street, it taught people like a whole new behavior, like occupying, and it came with certain rituals like twinkle fingers and people's mic and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that memes of the future, you know, they'll, they'll be even more complex. They'll teach us to do even more complex behaviors like how to, you know, win elections and how social movements can govern cities. But, but basically the core idea here is that, is that social movements are created through con- creating contagious moods, um, and those moods can be spread through memes and also contagious uh, and new tactics, which can also be spread through, through memes. Another thing you talk about in the book is horizontalism. So uh, a movement being equal, there's no, there's no leader, or you also say leaderless leadership. So my, my question is how to balance that, because I think you know, it's a very good quality to have you know, a level playing field and an inclusive movement. But the, the flip side is that it makes it hard to act quickly and to act decisively uh, without mm-hmm. like a, a def- really defined leadership structure. So what are your thoughts on how we achieve that balance? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I don't, I think that you definitely occupy like over fetishized leaderlessness and turned it into this like, you know, this golden thing. And that that was actually like ended up being detrimental to the movement because one of the real challenges I think one of the dangers of leaderlessness is that it can be used to justify tearing other people down like one way of imagining one way of conceiving of leaderlessness is that no one is better than anyone else I think that's a really negative way of seeing leaderlessness and then there's another way of seeing it seeing it which is that no one is lower than anyone else. I think that's like kind of a positive way of looking at it. So if, if you think that no one's better than anyone else, then you, then you, then you go around tearing anyone who, who, who seems smarter or more educated. You, see, you just tear them down. You know, like how dare you, you know, how dare you have spent your entire life thinking about these, 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 these problems and, and, and thinking that you have any good answers, like I'm not going to listen to you. But if you think that no one's below you, then that's better because then you, then you don't allow people to be, to be pushed down. You don't, you don't ignore the homeless person just because they don't have a PhD or whatever like that. So, so I think that the thing about leaderlessness is, is that it's, it has to be practiced properly. And I think during Occupy, it oftentimes became a way to block the mo- momentum of the movement because anyone who showed any sort of charisma or potential for um, excellence was, was torn down. And, um, and that was really negative. But, but ultimately, you know, we can't, we can't just out of frustration return to that old style politics where we just put our hopes in some sort of powerful leader. Like we know that that's, we just know that's not going to work. We already experienced that in the 20th century. We know exactly what happens when you put all of your hopes in, you know, Stalin or Mao or, you know, any sort of great leader. It just, it corrupts everything. And so it's, so it's basically like leaderlessness is one of these, and horizontalism is just one of these, one of these partially solved theorems of the social of the social movements today. Like we know that it, we know that it exists. It's like the Higgs boson, you know. Like we know it exists, or we suspect it exists. We don't quite know how to find it. We don't quite know the the behaviors that allow us to use it. Um, but we have to keep pursuing it, and we can't give up on the hunt for it because because the the other option of of leaders um, or a leader uh, isn't going to work. You know, I, I guess my main takeaway from, from the book, or, or one of the, the main takeaways is, you know, the idea that tactics have a sort of half-life, that, you know, what worked uh, five years ago or 10 years ago might not be the thing that works next year. Um, maybe an entirely new idea that no one can predict will, will take off uh, or form of activism or some sort of form of social protest um, that's never happened before. Maybe that will be the thing that causes the, the social spark, that causes things to change. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you about like, so, so we know we need new actions, we know we need new tactics, and we have a very uncertain future in front of us. We, we don't know what will work. We, we don't know when the timing will necessarily be ripe. Things can be really unpredictable. Um, as you say, like Occupy, no one would have predicted it, it would have worked just a few weeks before it did. 
mm-hmm. and then it and then before you know it it was all over the country and all around the world so i'd be curious to to get your takeaway then on on how we act how we i guess keep resilience uh in this mm-hmm. stage in this environment where things are, are really uncertain we need change and and yet we don't know how it's going to happen yeah you know what you're describing i think is is the end of protest like the end of protest means that it doesn't mean the absence of protest it means the proliferation of ineffective protest it means it means that it's one of those times when when activists don't know how to break out of their patterns they don't know what kind of tactics are going to be useful or going to be effective and i think you know the end of protest is it's a, it's a, it's a periodic um thing that happens to activism throughout human throughout human history and that and it come it eventually comes to an end you know i think occupy wall street that that broke out of a period a previous period of the end of protest like if you look at american activism between um the collapse of the anti globalization movement and the collapse of the anti war movement in 2003 basically until occupy in 2011 there wasn't a whole lot going on you know like um so it's basically like you know what is that 8 years of 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 the end of protest. And so, or if you look in in Russia, in the Russian Revolution, they had the 1905 revolution that failed, and they had the successful 1917 revolution 12 years later. So they had 12 years of the end of protest. And so I think what how you maintain your optimism is you realize, you have to realize as an activist that revolutions always happen when they are least likely. And that is so, it's so strange that it's like that, but that's how it is. If you read if you read Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution, he says the exact same thing. He says that um, you know the Russian Revolution in 1917 started on International Women's Day. No one thought that the revolution would start that day. In fact, the leading Bolsheviks, the leading revolutionaries at that time, had specifically said, "Let's not protest on International Women's Day because the time isn't ripe." But the women didn't didn't listen. They just went out and protested anyways, and all of a sudden, boom, a revolutionary moment starts that spirals into you know the Bolshevik Revolution. So. It's really important to just realize that it's actually almost a good thing to be living in a time when revolution seems unlikely because that means we might be even closer to it than we realize instead of one of those times when we are, you know, like between November and of 2011 and May of 2012 when everyone kind of like was celebrating ourselves and thinking we were doing so great but in fact we were actually losing. So, so I don't know, it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like you have to see the world a little bit upside down and 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 have a sense of you know, permanent revolutionary optimism. Yeah, and and my final question is: Are are you optimistic? Then I mean, it it seems like we're there's kind of a lot of uh, dark things right now in the world. You know, there's the rise of Trump. There's a lot of uh, seemingly a lot of reactionary forces. Uh, on the other hand, it does seem that there is some new spark of potential. Are you are you optimistic? Are you hopeful for for the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we live in a time when revolution is both necessary and we are you know we we are experiencing the largest and most frequent protests in human history so they're not working right now but at the same time with just a little bit of a shift of just a little bit of innovation we're going to see massive breakouts and there's constantly you know you have to you have it's like it's kind of like boiling water or something you know eventually it spills out of the pot and we have you know so much opportunity for that like right even right now in brazil there's there's crazy protests and who knows who knows what's going to happen that could kick off a whole new revolutionary wave if the if the protesters figure out some sort of new twist on their you know right now they're just marching in the streets but who knows what kind of twist they might come up with that really surprises people so i'm endlessly optimistic i think that we are all just going we're all living in a revolutionary moment and we're going to experience a really beautiful global revolution so it's just important you know, not to give up and to constantly innovate and to never be satisfied and to keep fighting. Well, Mike White, it's certainly uh, an interesting book and uh, it's certainly interesting times we we live in. Uh, Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Kevin. It was wonderful. That was my conversation with Michael White, activist, co-founder of Occupy Wall Street, and the author of the new book, The End of Protest. And that's it for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is made with support from The Climate Kick, that's KIC Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate-resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. 
Our website is elephantpodcast.org, where we have all of our episodes and you can find out how to subscribe to us. And to keep up to date, you can like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Elephant Podcast. And feel free to drop me a message over email. You can reach me at kevin at elephantpodcast.org. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon. <laughs>